Let's have a closer look at how the Sparsland model operates. Following the example of the DCT model and the JPEG algorithm, we describe this model in the context of 8x8 image patches. Our modeling relies on a given dictionary, a set of patches of the same size, which we will refer to as the atoms of the model. In this example, there are 256 atoms. And now comes the Sparsland model assumption, which states that every input patch can be described as a linear combination of a few atoms from the dictionary. I'm emphasizing the word few as it is central in our story. Two properties of the Sparsland model are sparsity and redundancy. We have started with a patch that contains 64 pixels, and our model suggests a new description of it as a linear combination of the atoms from the dictionary. Therefore, the new representation is a vector of length 256 carrying the linear combination weights. As such, our representation is clearly redundant, being much longer than the input data we started with. On the other hand, this representation is a sparse vector containing mostly zeros. In our example, only three of its entries are non-zeros. And this way, Spartan suggests describing our original 64 pixels patch by only six values, three for the non-zero coefficients and three for their location in the representation vector. Indeed, Spartland, and in fact, any other model, are all about dimensionality reduction, aiming to propose an alternative and more concise description of the incoming data in an attempt to claim that the information we work on is simpler than it may appear. One could refer to the Spartland model as the chemistry of information. In this interpretation, our dictionary contains the fundamental elements, just as held in the periodic table. The signals we model could be thought of as molecules, each being a composition of only few of the fundamental elements. Let's turn the above description into clearer mathematical terms. If the incoming signal is the column vector x and the representation is alpha, then the relation between the two is this linear system in which the matrix D is the dictionary, and its columns are the 256 atoms, each of them of length 64. Given D and X, we seek the sparsest solution of this system in order to suggest the simplest way to describe X as a linear combination with the fewest possible atoms. Well, think about it. This is exactly the transform we mentioned before. And thus, the two explanations we have given for our field, the transform interpretation and the Spartan model, are in fact the same. The Spartan model may seem simple and easy to use, but in fact, it is accompanied by several major challenges that might seem unbreakable at first. We start with the most elementary problem. Given a signal, we aim to find its sparse representation, basically seeking the small set of atoms explaining it. We refer to this task as atom decomposition. And the question we pose is, how should this be done? Consider the following example, in which there are 2,000 atoms to choose from and assume that we know that only 15 of them are in fact used to create our signal. How can we find this set? Well, we could explore exhaustively all the possibilities of choosing 15 out of the 2,000, and this number of options turns out to be huge. If indeed we try, investing one nanosecond for each of these options, we will need billions of years to conclude our computational process. So what can we do? The answer is, using approximation algorithms. In this course, we will introduce several such algorithms that can accomplish the needed computation in a fraction of a second. However, far more exciting will be the fact that we will be able to prove that under some conditions on the number of non-zeros in alpha, these algorithms are guaranteed to find the globally optimal solution. As an example, here is how an algorithm called the iterative reweighted least squares, IRLS, would perform. This graph shows the true set of 15 coefficients as red points. The IRLS is initialized by assuming that all the coefficients are zeros. As it iterates, it gets closer and closer to the true decomposition. And if continued, it will lead, in this case, to a perfect and accurate solution. Let's move to describe a second difficulty with Sparsland, the need to get the dictionary. One researcher is using Sparsland for handling natural images. Another uses it for audio signals. And a third is aiming to predict the stock market with it. Clearly, each signal source needs a different dictionary. And the question we pose here is, how should such dictionaries be obtained? 
The answer that Sparsnip gives is learning, using a large set of signal examples from the data source and finding the dictionary that best serves them, leading to the sparsest possible description. In our course, we will meet several such algorithms, such as the MOD and the KSVD, and see how they achieve their goal. This idea of tailoring the dictionary to the data is one of the prime forces of Sparseland, leading to the ability to handle almost any source, thereby serving as a universal model. In our list of challenges that Spartan meets, perhaps the toughest of all is this. Why is it working? What is it that makes it suitable for the diverse information sources we operate on? In our answer, we can take the empirical route and simply say that it has been used very successfully in a long series of tasks and for various data sources. A more challenging path is to suggest deep theoretical explanations for these success stories, something that researchers are still working on. As we have seen, the Spartan model poses tough challenges, but ones that have been answered constructively. The bottom line is this. This model is trustworthy, effective, and extremely successful. In this course, we will dive into the theory and practice of this model, and through this, learn of one of the most exciting chapters ever written in signal and image processing.